Hi, everyone. Welcome to Toronto Data Workshop. Today's guest is Jacob Baldwin from Pro Football Focus, or PFF. Uh, Jacob is a senior data scientist at PFF. He holds a Master's of Science degree in Applied Mathematics from the University of Washington, and he graduated from Clarkson University with a undergraduate degree in Physics and also Applied Mathematics and also Computer Science. Thank you very much for joining us, Jacob. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, pass coverage metrics in the NFL. Uh, and I hate to start off with a summary, but I did not give Rohan really too much background on what I'd be talking about. So I figured I'd kind of uh, fill everyone in with just an overview. Um, so I'll start by touching on PFF, how we do our data collection and player grading. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a new advanced coverage grade that we've been working on at PFF. Uh, I'm going to look at a metric comparison, looking at comparing this new advanced coverage grade to existing past coverage metrics. Um, and then we'll look at specific results for a few players in the NFL. All right, so we'll start with a little bit of a background on PFF. Um, so PFF uh, manually collects data from football games, uh, from American football games. And that's kind of the core of our business is collecting this data and selling the data as well as some of our analysis on top of it to football teams. Um, so our customers include uh, all the teams in the NFL, most of the college football teams, uh, as well as other professional leagues, uh, including the CFL. Um, so that's kind of one side of our business. We also sell our data and analysis to kind of um, consumers. So just fans of the game, um, as well as, you know, uh, fantasy football uh, players. We have some fantasy football tools, some betting tools, um, that kind of thing. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, our data is, is manually collected. Every football season, we hire um, a, a large number of part-time data collectors that watch every player on every play. And they collect um, kind of various data, everything from uh, objective measures of down, distance, field position, which players were on the field, um, where they lined up for a play. And then we also collect more subjective information. So we actually grade player performance and we measure stats like uh, pressures. Did someone get a pressure on the quarterback? Um, that kind of thing. Um, so I'm going to get a little into a little bit more detail about the uh, PFF grading process. Um, PFF grades have been around for uh, about almost 20 years now, and it's kind of uh, what what we're best known for. Um, so the way that we grade players is we split play up into um, eight different facets of play. So every player gets a, a grade uh, in, in pretty much one and only one facet of play for a given play. Um, and so kind of how we decide what facet a player falls into. First, we look at, is that player on offense or defense? Uh, if they're on the defensive side of the ball, they've got three different kind of facets that their, their grade could fall into. And so I'm going to be kind of focused on the coverage facet today. We'll be looking at uh, kind of the pass play type. Uh, and that's determined by what play the offense runs. So if the offense is running a pass play and there's a, a uh, defensive player, they'll be getting a grade either in the coverage or the pass rush facet. The pass rush is them trying to kind of tackle the quarterback before he can throw the ball. Uh, the coverage facet is trying to guard a receiver, prevent them from uh, completing a pass or make a tackle on the play. So just to get into kind of a concrete example of what that looks like, um, here is kind of dropping you right in the middle of a play, uh, of a recent play from an NFL game. Um, so this player that's circled here is the quarterback. Uh, because he is kind of dropping back to pass on this play, he's kind of looking down the field for a receiver. 
Uh, this will be a passing play. Uh, a run In a running play, you would probably hand off to the running back, and that running back would just start running down the field. Uh, so we'll take a look at the defensive players and what kind of facets they'd fall into in this play. The four circled players are trying to tackle the quarterback. Um, they would get a grade in the pass rush facet on this play. And so the other seven defensive players circled here um, will be getting a grade in the coverage facet of play. So they're all trying to um, defend these receivers, prevent them from catching a pass, uh, knock the pass down, tackle them once they catch the pass, uh, that sort of thing. All right, so just want to go over a couple key terms in the passing game. A targeted receiver is the player that the quarterback is actually trying to throw the ball to on the play. Uh, the targeted defender is the player responsible for covering the targeted receiver. Uh, and then separation is the distance between the coverage defender and receiver. Um, so these are going to be kind of important terms as we talk about uh, the various coverage grades. And so just concretely what that looks like, looking at the same play, if the quarterback threw the ball, it kind of looks like he's looking this way, but if he actually threw the ball to the circled receiver here, that player would be the targeted receiver on the play. And this circled defender would be the targeted coverage defender on the play. And kind of the distance between them would be what we'd be looking at to grade a player's uh, separation on the play. Okay, so we were kind of looking at that uh, uh, that nice angle on the, the, the previous couple of slides, that kind of overhead footage where you can see all the players. Um, but um, when PFF started out, <clears throat> excuse me, we did not actually have this nice uh, overhead angle to look at for every uh, NFL game. What we had instead is the camera angle on this side called the, this is called the broadcast camera angle. This would be what you would see on TV. Um, the camera really just kind of follows the ball on the play. So you can see a good number of the players are just completely cut off. Uh, and then when the quarterback passes, uh, the camera will kind of pan along and follow the ball. Um, so you'll really only be able to see the, um, the targeted receiver on the play. So kind of, I guess, keep that in mind as I'm sort of outlining the, the base uh, coverage grading process that we have at PFF. <clears throat> so kind of the, the key point uh, here is that non-targeted players um, receive a zero grade. And this is because what I was mentioning with the broadcast camera angle, you'll actually really only be able to see the targeted players. So that's all we're going to grade in this base um, coverage process. <clears throat> and then for a targeted player, we have this uh, kind of scale that we grade on that goes from negative two to two in increments of 0.5. Uh, I drew a little line kind of in the middle of the image there. Everything to the right, any grade to the right of the line is a positive outcome for the coverage defender. It means they did their job. Um, anything to the left of the line is kind of a negative outcome for them. They somehow uh, got beaten on the play. Um, so just what these kind of specific play level grades mean, um, a zero would be kind of an expected play. Um, the offense might complete a, a short pass and the, the targeted defender makes the tackle uh, for a short gain. Not a really positive play for the offense, not a really negative play either way. Um, a plus 0.5 would be kind of uh, uh, the defender has tight coverage and the pass is incomplete. A plus one or a plus 1.5 would be the coverage defender having good coverage and really making a play on the ball, breaking up the pass, maybe intercepting the pass. Um, and then a plus two is very rare. That'd be for very exceptional plays like in. Um, and then, so the negative grades are kind of the flip side of that. A negative 0.5 would be allowing a completion for a 10-yard gain, something that's positive for the offense, but not, um, not a huge play. Uh, a negative one uh, would be kind of getting burned for a really deep pass, maybe like, I think more like a 20 to 40-yard gain, something like that. 
Um, a negative 1.5 would be for something like allowing a touchdown on a really deep pass. And then a negative two, again, pretty rare would be for some kind of very egregious blunder, allowing a deep pass when kind of at the end of the game kind of thing. Um, and so one thing I do want to point out is the way that I'm describing these play level grades is definitely from a very results based um, lens. But we do try and grade to the extent that we can on the process a little bit. So if, for example, a coverage defender gets beat, uh, you know, for a deep game, the receiver kind of gets behind them on a play, but the quarterback just overthrows them completely or the receiver drops the ball, we'll still give them a negative one grade on that play, for example. Uh, and then kind of on the flip side of that, if the coverage defender is in really good coverage and just gets beat by a really good pass or the receiver makes a really good play, um, we're likely to probably not downgrade them or downgrade them less for that play. So even though this definitely is a very kind of results focused grading system, we do try and um, take that out to some extent and think about the process a little bit too. All right, and then I wanted, so that was kind of our play level coverage grades. I wanted to touch a little bit on our, our um, zero to 100 grades. These are kind of widely known among um, football fans. And this is how we roll up our play level grades into game level and season level grades for a player. Um, we have these zero to 100 grades for every facet. And then we also have like an overall zero to 100 grade that combines all the facets for a player. Um, I'm not gonna get too much into how these are computed. It's kind of a complex process, um, but really the, the end result is that they provide a pretty good summary of the play level grades. They have some nice properties. They're somewhat uh, normally distributed. So that kind of this, somewhere around 60 is like the mean and we've got somewhat of a normal distribution um but at the at the season level for players um but really they're just a a summary of the play level grades <clears throat> all right so i kind of touched on how our our base coverage collection process works and uh now i kind of want to get into um our our data source that we're using for um, our, our advanced coverage grade here. So I mentioned the difference between the broadcast film and the, this is called the all 22 angle or the coaches film. Uh, starting in 2019, um, PFF added a data collection process um, for uh, what's called the all coverage data collection process. So as part of this process, we look at every single receiver and coverage defender on every play, regardless of whether they were targeted or not. And we actually evaluate them based on the separation that they generated in the play. Um, so we knew that this was kind of a, a, a weakness to some extent of current coverage analysis was not looking at this data. So we kind of implemented this process and that's the data source that we're using here. All right, so I'll talk a little bit about how we actually make use of that uh, new data set. Um, so the, the work that we've done so far uses an overexpected play level model. Um, these kind of overexpected models are used a lot in sports analytics. Um, the idea is to kind of establish some sort of a baseline for what you would expect a player to do on a play or a team, whoever you're building the model for. Uh, and then you compare that to the player's or team's actual performance in that situation. Uh, and you usually just take the difference and that's kind of your, your performance relative to expectation. Um, so what we wanted to do here was we took a, a slightly different um, uh, kind of spin on the overexpected uh, method, instead of just building a, a baseline model and comparing to the actual result for the player, we did is we actually built two models. So we built a baseline model that doesn't include this separation uh, data as a feature, really just includes things that are outside of player's control. And then we built a second model that uses the same features, 
but includes the separation data. And for both of these models, we wanted to um, predict the PFF base coverage grade that I mentioned, that grade that goes from negative two to two. So we looked at, um, to train these models, we looked at only targeted players. So we were kind of saying, if a player was targeted in this play, what grade would we expect them to get? Um, and, and kind of our, our reason for doing this is we wanted to find a way to incorporate this new separation data that we had with our base data collection process, kind of put everything to some extent on the same scale here. Um, one other thing I did want to mention with these overexpected models is a really key thing to, to make sure when you're building them is that anything you're putting in your baseline model, you want to make sure the player doesn't have control over it. If you're using uh, this model to evaluate player performance and you were to put, say, something like separation in your baseline model, well, the player's separation allowed is actually part of their ability. So you want to make sure that you keep that piece separate. Um, so just a few details on our models that we used. Um, really very simple models. We used cap boost because we had a lot of categorical variables. Um, we really trained for very few iterations, used a high uh, minimum leaf size. We wanted these models to be just as, as general as possible. They're really just for, again, establishing a baseline and kind of mapping our separation expectation into the same range as our um, base coverage grade. So here's kind of just a full list of different features that we used. The orange bars are the uh, features that were used in the model, kind of the base model, not including separation. And the blue bars are the features used in the, um, uh, the model that did include separation. So these are feature importances just based on uh, the magnitude of the prediction change if you tweak the features. Um, you can see that separation in that model is far and away the, the most important feature, um, but there are kind of all these other features that are outside of player's control that also have quite an impact on the um, expected grade for a play. Okay, so talked a little bit about how we do compute these play level advanced coverage grades. Um, now in order to kind of look at them at the season level and compare them to other metrics, uh, we, we need some way of rolling them up to a season level grade. And we really, again, chose a, a pretty simple method here, kind of treated our, our final advanced coverage grade as like a sample Z-score almost, where we've got X is the player season mean, um, mu is the population mean, just the mean grade across all snaps. Um, the standard deviation across all snaps, and then N is just the number of snaps that the player played in a season. Okay, so that was kind of the background on the model, how we're computing this new advanced coverage grade. Um, I also wanted to, before we kind of show results or anything here, I wanted to talk about how we look at the efficacy of different metrics for player evaluation. Um, so there's, in this study, there's kind of two ways we went about looking at it. The first method is we use stability. Uh, this is again, a, a pretty widely used uh, measure in, in sports metrics, um, just looking at the year over year correlation of the different metrics for a player. So the idea is that if a player's metric is pretty consistent year over year, then we are measuring something that's inherent to that player and not a result of their situation or noise or, you know, whatever else might affect um, might affect their performance. Um, so that's kind of a, a one thing that would be that we want to have is a more stable metric. Um, but the other thing that we want to do is make sure that our metric is actually um, predictive of team success. So it's good to have something that's stable that seems to be consistent for a player, but we also want to see from a team's perspective, is this, you know, having a player with a better metric, is this actually going to help our on-field result? Um, and the way that we do this here is using a method called retrodiction. I'm going to talk about that a little more on the, the next slide, but kind of 
uh, I, I put this quote here as, as like the core reason we wanted to use retrodiction. It's really good at leveling out all the assumptions that might be made by different metrics, kind of putting them all on a level playing field. So I wanted to touch on the difference between retrodiction versus prediction. So retrodiction is kind of uh, predicting the past, so to speak. So um, for example, if we were trying to uh, uh, measure how our, our metric performed in a retrodiction test, what we would do is we would look at all our players' uh, metrics from say 2022, and then look at a team's metrics from 2023 and wait, take like the mean uh, of all those player metrics that played for from 2022 that played for the team in 2023 and weight them based on the actual playing time of those players in 2023. So kind of the reason for doing this is so you don't have to worry about assumptions about playing time in your model. Sports, especially in football, uh, injuries have a huge impact. So a player might have great underlying metrics, but they never see the field for your team the next year because they get injured. Something that makes it a lot harder to put metrics on a level playing field in a kind of a prediction scenario is what do you do for, how do you kind of anticipate injuries? So using a retrodiction method, we can just totally take those out of the equation. Um, the other thing that we can do uh, kind of using this method is we can compute a replacement level player and kind of use that value for rookies or players with limited snaps in the league um, so that we kind of have, again, keep our, our assumptions as consistent as possible across metrics. Um, this is a method that is used in basketball. Those are kind of the uh, examples that I have linked here. Um, in basketball, they look at player metric values compared to what's called uh, team rating. Uh, which is really just a measure of overall team efficiency in the next season. Uh, and they use minutes played to represent playing time. So kind of the, the analogous measures in football are uh, a metric called expected points added, just uh, in a, again, an efficiency metric for teams and um, snaps played as the uh, measure of playing time. All right, so kind of laying out how we're going to evaluate our metrics, um, let's actually take a look at how we did. Um, so the top two rows of this table are, first of all, the PFF advanced coverage grade that I ran through, and then also a PFF separation grade. Uh, this is just using the raw separation grades that our, our graders um, collected and not doing any of that expectation model stuff, really just looking at those raw grades as kind of a baseline to see if our expectation models are actually adding anything here. Um, and so both of those incorporate this additional data source with separation data. Um, then the, the bottom uh, five rows there are metrics that use only targeted plays. So talked a little bit about the PFF zero to 100 grade um, there's a few other metrics here as well. We've got target rate, which is just how often a player is targeted when they're in coverage. We've got completion percentage allowed. So the rate of completed passes against a player when they are targeted in coverage. Yards allowed per snap, just sum up their total yards allowed when they're targeted divided by their total number of coverage snaps. Uh, and then QB rating allowed. So this is a metric that's been around in the NFL for quite a long time to evaluate quarterbacks just uses a formula that takes into account yards, interceptions, and touchdowns. And again, we just compute this um, for a defender uh, when they're targeted in, in coverage. Um, so just wanted to reflect that the PFF 0 to 100 grade is far from the only metric that's used to evaluate coverage players. And we wanted to kind of compare our metric um, uh, with a, a few different uh, options here. So you can see that incorporating the separation data really improves the correlation with uh, team EPA in the retrodiction test. Uh, and you can also see that it is, uh, for the most part, more stable um, by position. And so the reason that we break up by position here 
is the linebackers, safeties, and cornerbacks in coverage are asked to do very different things. So their kind of base expected values for these metrics would be very different just based on their position. So if we kind of lump them all together, we might see a high year-over-year -year correlation, but that would more be due to players having different roles versus something that's actually inherent to the player. Um, so that's kind of why we split it up by season here, or sorry, by position here. Uh, we can really see for linebackers, especially, uh, there's quite an improvement in stability. Um, one thing I did want to call out is in the target rate, you can actually see how safeties uh, seem to have a really high stability. And that actually is probably a good example of what I'm talking about, where we have different groups that kind of get lumped together. There's really almost two distinct kinds of safeties in the NFL. And one of them will, we would expect to have a significantly higher target rate than the other group. So that's likely why we've got a really high stability here. So the main takeaways from this are really just uh, how much incorporating this additional data, the separation data, uh, really improves the stability for players and also um, predictiveness of team success. Okay, so we went through and did some uh, quantitative analysis of our, our new metric against some existing coverage metrics. Um, now I just wanted to talk about, you know, it's always important to do a qualitative analysis, especially with uh, sports analytics. So we'll look at some uh, examples. Uh, uh, kind of a good way to go about this is look at some players that are widely considered the best players in whatever area you're looking at and see if your metric has them rated highly. That's a pretty good baseline test. Um, look and see if there's any players that really exemplify some of the qualities of your metric. In our case, we're looking for it to be more stable year over year and maybe more predictive of who becomes a really good um, coverage defender later in their career. Um, and then we also want to look at where does our metric maybe fall short? We'll look at some early career players, potential breakout candidates, um, and also touch a little bit on some other positions. Uh, all right, so first we've got um, uh, our first example of a player who we would expect to rate really highly is Fred Warner. He is uh, a linebacker for San Francisco, widely considered to be the best coverage linebacker in the league. And you can see by our advanced coverage grade, he really does rate out really, really highly. Now, granted, he looks good by most of the metrics we have here, um, but our, our advanced coverage grade did have him actually ranked number one in the league on kind of three out of these six years we have here. So it, he, he really shines in, in limiting separation. Um, another one of our kind of expected top players is uh, Sauce Gardner you know, considered one of the best cornerbacks in the league. And again, same thing. We see he ranks really highly in our advanced coverage grade in his first two seasons, uh, 22 and 23. He was the number one ranked player in this metric by a, a pretty solid margin. Uh, this year, he struggled a little more so far, but you can see he's still doing a really good job um, limiting separation. So then we'll get into a couple players that really... Um, I think kind of start to show how this metric can be useful. Um, we've got Jalen Johnson here and you can see he came into the league in 2020 and you can see kind of the first three years of his career in terms of PFF zero to 100 grade and in terms of QB rating allowed, he was kind of just um, middle, middle of the league. Uh, but in terms of separation allowed and advanced coverage grade, he really rated near the top of the league. And the last couple of years, He's really completely broken out. He's started to excel in some of the basic metrics as well. And he started to get a lot of recognition as one of the top corners in the league. We'll take another look at it, kind of a success story here, Pat Sertan. Um, and, and what we'll look at with him is kind of a bit of fluctuation in his basic uh, metrics. His PFF zero to 100 grade uh, has kind of bounced around a little bit throughout his career, but Again, you can see the improved stability of the uh, advanced coverage grade. He's been near the top of the league every year. Another really, really highly ranked cornerback. Uh, all right, so now let's look at a little bit more of, of a case where maybe 
uh, looking at the advanced coverage grade isn't necessarily the best thing to do. Um, we'll take a look at Darnay Holmes. Um, so uh, he is a slot cornerback currently for the, uh, I believe he currently plays for the Raiders. Um, and kind of early on in his career, he's pretty solid at limiting separation for a rookie. I mean, he was just kind of middle of the league, but for a rookie, that's, that's really solid and kind of, uh, in 22 and 23, he really did a good job of limiting separation. Um, but he never really um, took off in terms of the basic metrics. And he hasn't played a ton so far uh, this season. And there's there's a decent chance it's because he's a kind of a, a smaller player. And so he may be good at limiting separation. But as important as we've kind of shown that that is, it isn't everything in football. You still need to be able to break up the pass or tackle the receiver or kind of make the play at the end, so to speak. And I think that's where uh, Darnay Holmes hasn't had the most success in his career so far. Um, not to say he couldn't still break out later on, but uh, his might be a good example where you also want to look at some of these um, basic metrics as well. Um, because again, separation isn't, isn't everything for football. Um, so just wanted to highlight um, kind of a couple potential breakout candidates, some early career players that have really shined in this metric. Uh, Christian Benford is an outside corner for Buffalo, and Jaquan McMillian uh, is a slot corner for the Broncos. Uh, again, like I mentioned, it's really uh, tough to come into the league and succeed in limiting separation as a rookie. Um, but both of these players uh, started off pretty strong, and especially Benford uh, has just really improved throughout his career. Uh, they're both in the top 10 cornerback rankings in advanced coverage grades so far this year. Um, so I'd expect kind of both of these guys to potentially join the ranks of top cornerbacks. Uh, and because I touched on a couple of their players so far, I did want to highlight uh, kind of an interesting case uh, of the Denver Broncos corners here. Uh, Pat Sertan, uh, Jaquan McMillian, and Riley Moss all play for the Broncos this year, and all of them rank really highly in PFF advanced coverage grade. Pat Sertan has been in the league for a few years. We looked at him as one of our kind of uh, poster child examples, uh, and you can see how his target rate is actually extremely low, uh, and which is uh, good. So he ranks highly in, in having a low target rate. Uh, so likely this is because teams are avoiding throwing at him. He has a reputation as one of the top corners in the league, so they are not going to throw his way as often. Uh, Riley Moss and Jaquan McMillian kind of as a result see a higher target rate. Teams are avoiding Pat Sertan, but they still want to throw the ball. They've got to throw it somewhere. Um, so they throw at those two guys and both of them so far for young I mean, really for any players, but especially for young players, they're holding up really well. So the Broncos look like they've got probably one of the top cornerback groups in the, in the league and a young group too. Um, so I mentioned linebackers, just wanted to highlight a couple more linebackers. We looked at Fred Warner before to show how consistent the advanced coverage grade was for him. Um, but we'll look at a, a couple other examples. Um, Alex Anzalone uh, uh, is a good example whose PFF zero to 100 grade has really bounced around, kind of just been in the, uh, sort of okay range for the most part. Um, but his advanced coverage grade and his, his separation grade have really consistently ranked pretty highly. Uh, and I think that's that's been reflected in that he's continued to get a lot of playing time every year, even if his kind of base uh, uh, metrics aren't looking as good. So I think for him, uh, we can see that the advanced coverage grade and the separation grade um, really helps tell the story for him a little bit. Uh, I've also got um, Demario Davis. Um, again, he's kind of a similar story to to Fred Warner, where uh, uh, he looks really good in a lot of metrics. Um, but again, you can just see how he ranks near the top of the league in advanced coverage grade uh, every year throughout his career. Even if you can actually see, he bounces around quite a bit in that QB rating allowed, uh, but his his advanced metrics are really solid. Uh, so since I mentioned that. You know, our, our advanced coverage grade is really good for linebackers. Just want to look at a couple of young players here. These guys are all um, second-year players. 
that have uh, had a lot of success this season. Um, Toho Toho has really improved uh, from his first year. And then uh, these other two guys, Hemley and Simpson, um, actually didn't even play enough snaps to to qualify uh, for their first season. Um, but this year, in more opportunities, they've looked really good. So, again, potential breakout candidates for coverage linebackers here. Um, so kind of some next steps. Um, you will probably notice that I, in my specific player examples, I did not talk at all about safeties. Um, the the two groups of safeties that I mentioned, there's there's probably one group of players that plays a lot closer to the line of scrimmage, gets a lot more um, coverage matchups. There will be another group of players that who are really the the name the reason the position was named safety. They they play really deep and kind of just try and tackle anyone who gets by the the front line of defense. And those players are extremely difficult to evaluate, even with the separation data because they just don't get a lot of opportunities. Players just don't run into their zones very often. So there's not, even with the added separation data, we're still not getting a ton of information on those players. So our metric is pretty solid for players that, for safeties that line up close to the line of scrimmage. Some players at the top of those rankings are like uh, Kyle Hamilton and Brian Branch, who are considered really good players. So it looks good there, but for deep safeties, really it, it, it's tough. Some of the players kind of considered the best ranked players there or their, their scores are kind of fluctuating all over the place. Um, so that's definitely one area for improvement to see if we can do better for those deep safeties. Uh, we want to look at screen passes a little bit. This is a different kind of pass play. That's a little more similar to a run play. And we really didn't uh, account for them very much with, with our analysis here. Um, another good thing to do would be look at, we looked at kind of the stability in aggregate of these metrics, but one thing that teams are interested in especially is when a player changes teams or maybe a coaching staff changes on a team and the player is maybe asked to do a different kind of coverage than they were before, how well do those metrics, do their metrics still stay stable in that case? Have we done a, a good enough job accounting for um, um, kind of everything about their situation that, hey, it really is consistent across teams, um, ski, different coverage schemes, all that kind of thing. Uh, and then another thing we'd like to do is um, investigate other facets of play. Uh, again, really just focused on a, a small sliver of data that PFF collects here, focusing on these coverage plays. Uh, I mentioned uh, just in terms of offense and defense, there's seven other facets that we grade. So we'd like to um, do a similar analysis um, on these other facets and see the, the state of metrics there. Um, but we kind of started with coverage because we knew we had this other additional data set that would be very useful. Uh, and we kind of suspect that coverage is our least stable uh, of the, the base metrics that we have. So started with coverage, but definitely interested in looking at other facets of play as well. All right. Yeah. Um, thanks for having me and i um, happy to take any questions on, you know, any of the stuff that I've talked about here or PFF, you know, stuff I maybe didn't talk about here, any questions on PFF in general. So thanks. Thank you very much, Jacob. That was incredible. Uh, and certainly changes how I'm going to be watching the football on, on Sunday. Uh, are there any questions from folks? Uh, feel free to raise your hand and I can call on you or put the question to the chat and I can read it out. Um, Maybe while people are thinking, um, oh, Vincent, go for it. Yeah, uh, thanks for the great talk. That was that was, that was fantastic. Uh, I have uh, several questions, like three of them. Uh, two about results based grading, and one about other uh, player groups. So the the two about results based grading is the um, what are the challenges for you in terms of retrodiction? So it sounds like the pass for example yeah. so in a way the game outcomes are already kind of built into your individual player grades so does that make a difference when you try to predict the past where the data is kind of endogenous to all this so that's the first question um then the results based grades are kind of situational aren't they so if a defensive player fails on a hail mary situation right that's a that's a really bad grade so uh, 
what, what's your sense of like what's the extent of game situation or environment or luck that's built into these grades or th does that matter at all and then just going outside of the the stuff that you talked about what, what do you think are the the hardest player groups to grade like this so uh, it's just uh I'm, I'm curious so the, does it work better for the the skill positions or the, is the line harder or so what do you think yeah um okay so let's see first question was um the oh the the grade and the results being potentially somewhat baked into the grading yes um for sure so when you look at our coverage grades they're actually very highly correlated to team epa allowed in the same season um as i kind of mentioned as you brought up like the fact that the result is to some degree baked into the coverage grade and we try and do the process as much as we can the fact that the result is baked in means that they are actually our grade that's probably most correlated um, with epa allowed um in the same season but when you do um when you look at how it's correlated to epa allowed in the next season um that's actually where the separation based grades actually kind of outperform uh that coverage grade and I, I i think the reason why is there's a lot there is a, a decent bit of noise that goes into um that goes into that that coverage grade I mean, one, there's a decent bit of noise. Two, that coverage grade has a much smaller sample size because there's a lot of these non-targeted plays where it's a little bit informative in that if you didn't have the ball thrown your way, you probably didn't mess up too badly. Um, but maybe the maybe you did and the quarterback just didn't throw it your way. Um, so I think the two advantages that the baking in the separation has in terms of making it more predictive for the next season um, is that it incorporates a lot more data and it is more, more of a pure skill uh, driven grade. Again, the coverage grade is still, we still try and have it as process based as we can, but yeah, there's a lot of outside factors that go into it. Um, right. And so the coverage grade being situational, yes, it definitely is um, to an extent. So, uh, for example, on a, a first and 10 play, um, a gain, uh, a pass where the offense gains three yards and the coverage defender makes the tackle, um, that will probably get a zero grade for a three yard gain. A gain, a, a, a third and three pass uh, where the offense gains three yards. Uh, and the coverage defender makes the tackle. So kind of same result, uh, very well may get a negative 0.5 uh, coverage grade because the offense actually achieved their goal on that play. Um, part of the grading process is actually looking at what the coverage defender was trying to do and did they actually accomplish that. So in the case of a first and 10 play, most likely they'll be perfectly happy to let up this three yard gain. That's what they're trying to do is actually not allow a deep pass. But on the third and three scenario, uh, they're probably trying to stop the offense from getting a first down. And so the three yard gain can mean very different things between those two situations. So there definitely is this kind of situational aspect built into it for sure. Um, and then in terms of, uh, uh, position groups that it's it's easiest to grade. That's a really good point. Um, for sure, uh, I think that coverage defenders are the most difficult um, uh, facet to grade. The um, if I I'll actually sorry, I'll just fly my way back to um, those facets really quick and talk through that. Um, right. So the, the run blocking and run defense facets in that top row there, in my opinion, are, are much easier to grade in terms of, uh, a stable and just a good metric in general. Um, it's much more clear who has won and lost the matchup on the play. Uh, you can really tell like, 
one player on offense is usually trying to block, not always, but usually trying to block one player on defense. And so it's really easy to look at that matchup and say, okay, yes, they did block them successfully. So we're going to give them a good grade or no, they didn't block them successfully. So we're going to give them um, a bad grade. And that is also much less results-based. It's really just within those two players control. There's not a lot of outside factors. You're not worried about how good of a throw the quarterback made accounting for any of that stuff. Very similar with pass blocking and pass rush. Um, if we actually look at our example here, um, again, focused on these four uh, uh, defensive players. We've got them very clearly matched up with, uh, uh, three players are matched up with, um, well, there must be a couple, who do we have there? Oh yeah, so three players are in kind of one-on-one -on -one matchups and then one player is sort of getting double teamed. But it's still very clear like the that on this play, Washington, the team in the white, their offensive line has done their job. Um, they have They are preventing those players from sacking the quarterback. So I think that our, our pass blocking, um, pass rush grades and our run blocking, run defense grades are really, really good just as the base grades um, because I, I think it's the easiest grade to, honestly, it's the easiest grade to, for just me as kind of a, uh, a not a football expert by any stretch. Like I feel like I can pick up how to make those grades pretty quickly just by watching a few plays. Um, and they're the most isolated from outside influences, whereas the coverage grades are a little more, there's a little more to them and they have the most kind of outside effect. Um, yeah, sorry, that was kind of a, a long-winded answer, but I, I do think coverage grades are are kind of the most, the most difficult. The PFF... The PFF offensive line and defensive line grades, I would really like, they're really, really good at evaluating player skill, in my opinion. Uh, Johnny? I'll just read out the question, maybe. Uh, what is the frequency with which teams are checking the starter points? Do they look at them week by week or year to year, day by day? Yeah. Um, ha, so the, for the most part, it, it depends on who you're talking about within the team. Uh, as a whole, the teams are probably looking at these data points as frequently as day by day. So uh, in season um, coaching staffs, when they are uh, game planning or trying to figure out their best way to uh, defeat the opponent the next week, um, they're going to be probably the, the first thing they do, their like initial look at the other team is going to be based on uh, a decent amount of the data points that, that we collect at PFF, just kind of their first look of, Hey, even something as simple as this team likes to run the ball more, or this team likes to use these types of running plays. Um, that would be the kind of data that probably coaches would be looking at most often on a, a week to week basis. Uh, and then uh, uh, when we talk about um, more of the season level grades, the kind of player level evaluation stuff. Now, coaches will look at that, too, to see which players on the other team are maybe really strong or which players are not as strong. So who they might want to target or who they might want to avoid on the other team. So coaches do look at that stuff, too, um, on a weekly basis. But. I would say probably more so you start to get into um, uh, player personnel people. So front office people that are making decisions on should we bring in this new player to our team or should we bring in a different player? Should we cut this player? Um, they're looking at that stuff a little bit week to week, but that'll be much more of an off season thing. They'll look at this data to prepare for the draft or free agency. Um, so really it's, um, it's honestly at, at all different all different levels of these organizations use this data. Um, there will even be uh, a lot of teams in the NFL now have teams of data scientists that will really be just pulling in our raw data. We have like uh, kind of an application with a UI that we sell to teams and that coaches use to some extent. Um, but a lot of teams have, um, they're just 
pulling in our data and building their own models off of it too. So, and, and obviously those folks are, you know, they're pulling in our data every day for sure. So um, yeah, all different levels. We've probably got time for about two more questions. So I'll just take them from the chat. Um, so the first one is in a sport that has a lot of the old guard, do teams all accept the information or are there, or are there those that have less trust in data? Um, stop sharing this. Um, yeah, it's definitely, um, uh, definitely a mix. Um, like I mentioned, there's some teams that have, especially in the NFL, there's some teams that have an entire, uh, uh, groups, uh, entire departments of data scientists and engineers and have kind of fully, uh, fully embraced being a, a data driven team. Um, there's others that are maybe not as fast to kind of, um, uh, adopt those approaches. But I mean, honestly, as a whole, um, I, I really think especially PFF data has been adopted in most places. And the, the, the main reason there is really just for uh, how much time it can save coaches. I talked a lot about the analysis that, that I did here, but before PFF, before we had these data collectors watching every game and, and collecting all this data, if coaches wanted that, they would have to do it themselves. They would have to go back and watch old film of, if they wanted to know the entire history of Andy Reid and the play calls he made, they would have to go back and watch all of Andy Reid's games and collect all this data themselves. Now they just have this data and they just have it from us. They don't have to do any of that. You know, they'll, they'll still watch the film themselves of like recent things that they find interesting that they want to break down. They're still watching a ton of film themselves, but they don't have to necessarily go back and break everything down. They can just get straight to what they're looking for. So I, I think just about every team, NFL and college, has really embraced that part of it because it saves them a ton of time. Then in terms of actually using data in their decision-making directly, that's a little, a little more mixed. And perhaps just the time for the last one question, uh, again from the chat, are there any PFF metrics that have statistical properties that are really annoying to work with, or are they all pretty straightforward to use in statistical analysis? Mm -hmm. That is a good question. Um, <clears throat> there are some, there are some things that, um, uh, honestly, if I was to pick one that's, that's maybe the most annoying, it probably would be be coverage grade. Um, I, I mentioned how it is a kind of a results. There's like a bit of results-based stuff baked into that grading scheme. And I totally understand why uh, they did the data collection that way. It, it is tough to separate out, but the other, um, the other facets are so, so much more is it, you're able to do so much more to remove the results from the equation. Like the quarterback grades are just based on how good of a throw the quarterback makes. Um, so if we were able to maybe somehow, again, it'd be really tough, but if we were able to kind of remove that from the, the coverage grade, that would make it a little um, easier to work with. My favorite part about working at PFF though, is how, um, being a company that is run by data collection, that's really like our core thing. It's so easy to go to any of our data collectors and get a full explanation of like how this data is collected. I mean, first of all, we have a document and we have processes documented. You can go and talk to the people that are collecting the data. A lot of times the people that invented the collection processes still work here. So you can get like full explanations of why they collected data a certain way. If you find, if you ever find an error in the data, which does happen from time to time, you can get that like fixed right away. You just send them a message and they look at it and, and get it fixed. No problem. Um, so yeah, being able to like work so closely with people that are, are 
such experts in the data collection process um, is extremely helpful. And that's why maybe I don't have a, a better answer for anything that's difficult to work with. I just ask them and they, they get me sorted out, so. On that note, uh, noting that it's, it's one o'clock, we might just say thank you uh, once again to Jacob. Uh, that was a fantastic uh, talk and I have so many more questions that I wish we had time for. Uh, but thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, I hope that everyone has a nice rest of the day. And Jacob, they can, folks can add you on LinkedIn or something like that. Is that the best way if they have follow-ups? Oh, yes, sorry, look at that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Definitely add me Add me on LinkedIn. Um, shoot me a message on there. Uh, you can shoot me an email too. Um, but yeah, that works. Excellent. Have a nice rest of the day, everyone.